has your sort of imagination been captivated by, you mentioned GPT and all the bigger and bigger and bigger language models. And uh, what are the limits of those models, do you think? So just for the task of natural language. Basically the way GPT is trained, right, is you just download a massive amount of uh, text data from the internet and you try to predict the next uh, word in a sequence, roughly speaking. Uh, you're predicting little word chunks, uh, but uh, roughly speaking, that's it. Um, and what's been really interesting to watch is, uh, basically it's a language model. Language models have actually existed for a very long time. Um, there's papers on language modeling from 2003, even earlier. Can you explain in that case what a language model is? Uh, yeah, so language model, just uh, basically the rough idea is um, just predicting the next uh, word in a sequence, mm -hmm. roughly speaking. Uh, so there's a paper from, for example, uh, Bengio uh, and the team from 2003, where for the first time they were using a, a neural network to take, say, like three or five words and predict the um, next word. And they're doing this on much smaller data sets. And the neural net is not a transformer, it's a multi-layer perceptron. But, uh, but it's the first time that a neural network has been applied in that setting. But even before neural networks, there were um, language models, except they were uh, using um, n-gram models. So n-gram models are just uh, count-based models. So um, if you try to if you try to take two words and predict a third one, uh, you just count up how many times you've seen any uh, two-word combinations and what came next. Mm -hmm. And th what you predict as coming next is just what you've seen the most of in the training set. And so uh, language modeling has been around for a long time. Neural networks have done language modeling for a long time. So really what's uh, new or interesting or exciting is just realizing that when you scale it up uh, with a powerful enough neural net, a transformer, you have all these emergent properties where uh, basically what happens is if you have a large enough data set of text, you are in the task of predicting the next uh, word, you are multitasking a huge amount of different kinds of problems. You are multitasking understanding of you know, chemistry, physics, human nature. Lots of things are sort of clustered in that objective. It's a very simple objective, but actually you have to understand a lot about the world to, to make that prediction. You just said the U word understanding. Uh, are you, <laughs> in terms of chemistry and physics and so on, what do you feel like it's doing? Is it searching for the right context? Uh, in, in like, yeah. what, what, is it, what is the actual process happening here? Yeah, so basically it gets a thousand words and it's trying to predict the thousand and first. And uh, in order to do that very, very well over the entire data set available on the internet, you actually have to basically kind of understand the context of, of what's going on in there. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's a sufficiently hard problem that you, uh, if you have a powerful enough computer, like a transformer, you end up with uh, interesting solutions. <laughs> and uh, you can ask it uh, to do all kinds of uh, things. And... Um, it, it it shows a lot of uh, emergent properties, like in-context learning. That was the big deal with GPT and the original paper when they published it, is that you can just sort of uh, prompt it in various ways and ask it to do various things, and it will just kind of complete the sentence. But in the process of just completing the sentence, it's actually solving all kinds of really uh, interesting problems that we care about. Do you think it's doing something like understanding? Like um, and when we yeah. use the word understanding for us humans? I think it's doing some understanding. It in its weights, it understands. I think a lot about the world, and it has to in order to predict the next word in a sequence. So it's trained on the data from the internet. Uh, what do you think about this this approach in terms of data sets of using data from the internet? Do you think the internet has enough structured data to teach AI about human civilization? Yeah, so I think the internet has a huge amount of data. I'm not sure if it's a complete enough set. I don't know that. Uh, text is enough for having a sufficiently powerful AGI as an outcome. Um, of course, there is audio and video and images yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so text by itself, I'm a little bit suspicious about. There's a ton of things we don't put in text in writing, uh, just because they're obvious to us about how the world works and the physics of it and that things fall. We don't put that stuff in text because why would you? We share that understanding. And so text is a communication medium between humans, and it's not a uh, all-encompassing medium of knowledge about the world. But as you pointed out, we do have video and we have images and we have audio. And so I think that uh, that definitely helps a lot, but we haven't trained models uh, sufficiently uh, across both, across all of those modalities yet. Uh, so I think that's what a lot of people are interested in. But I wonder what that shared understanding of like what we might call common sense has to be learned, inferred in order to complete the sentence correctly. So maybe the fact that it's implied on the internet the model's gonna have to learn that. 
not by reading about it, by inferring it in the representation. So like common sense, just like we, I don't think we learn common sense. Like nobody says, tells us explicitly, we just figure it all out by mm -hmm. interacting with the world. Right. And so here's a model of reading about the way people interact with yeah. the world and might have to infer that. I wonder. Yeah. Uh, you you briefly worked on a project called the World of Bits, training an R RL system to take actions on the internet um, versus just consuming the internet like we yeah. talked about. Do you think there's a future for that kind of system interacting with the internet to help the learning? Yes, I think that's probably the, uh, the final frontier for a lot of these models uh, because, um, so as you mentioned, when I was at OpenAI, I was working on this project, World of Bits, and basically it was the idea of giving neural networks access to a keyboard and a mouse. And uh, the idea what could is possibly that, go wrong. <laughs> so basically, you um, you perceive the input of the uh, screen pixels, and uh, basically the state of the computer is sort of visualized uh, for human consumption in images of the web browser and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then you give the neural network the ability to press keyboards and use the mouse. And we we're trying to get it to, for example, complete bookings and you know interact with user interfaces. And um, what did you learn from that experience? Like, what was some fun stuff? This is a super cool idea. Yeah. I mean, it's like, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the step between observer to actor yeah. is a super fascinating step. Yeah. Well, it's the universal interface in the digital realm, I would say. Yeah. And uh, there's a universal interface in like the physical realm, which in my mind is a humanoid form factor kind of thing. Uh, we can later talk about Optimus and so on. But mm -hmm. I feel like there's a... Uh, they're kind of like a similar philosophy in some way, where the human, the world, the physical world is designed for the human form, mm -hmm. and the digital world is designed for the human form of seeing the screen and using keyword, no, keyboard and mouse. And so it's the universal, universal interface that can uh, basically uh, command the digital infrastructure we've built up for ourselves. And so it feels like a very powerful interface to to command and to build on top of. Uh, now, uh, to your question as to like what I learned from that, it's interesting because the world of bits was basically uh, too early. I think, at OpenAI at the time. Um, this is around 2015 or so. And the zeitgeist at that time was very different in AI from the zeitgeist today. At the time, everyone was super excited about reinforcement learning from scratch. Uh, this is the time of the Atari paper uh, where uh, neural networks were playing Atari games um, and beating humans in some cases, uh, AlphaGo and so on. So everyone was very excited about tra training neural networks from scratch using reinforcement learning um, directly. It turns out that reinforcement learning is an extremely inefficient way of training neural networks because you're taking all these actions and all these observations and you get some sparse rewards once in a while. So you do all this stuff based on all these inputs and once in a while you're like told you did a good thing, you did a bad thing. And it's just an extremely hard problem. You can't learn from that. Uh, you can burn a forest <laughs> and you can sort of brute force through it. And we saw that I think with, uh, you know, with uh, Go and Dota and so on, and it does work. Uh, but it's extremely inefficient uh, and uh, not how you want to approach problems, uh, practically speaking. And so that's the approach that at the time we also took to World of Bits. Uh, we would uh, have an agent initialize randomly, so with keyboard mash and mouse mash and try to make a booking. And it's just like revealed the insanity of that approach very quickly, where you have to stumble by the correct booking in order to get a reward of you did it correctly. And you're never going to stumble by it by chance at random. So even with a simple web interface, there's too many options. There's just too many options, uh, and uh, it's too sparse of a reward signal. And you're starting from scratch at the time, and so you don't know how to read, you don't understand pictures, images, buttons, right. you don't understand what it means to like make a booking. Yeah. But now what's happened is uh, it is time to revisit that, and OpenAI is interested in this, uh, companies like Adept are interested in this, and so on. And uh, the idea is coming back uh, because the interface is very powerful, but now you're not training an agent from scratch. You are taking the GPT as an initialization. So GPT is pre-trained on all of text and it understands what's a booking. It understands what's a sub submit. It understands um, quite a bit more. And so it already has those representations. They are very powerful. And that makes all of the training significantly more efficient um, and makes the problem tractable. Should the interaction be with the, like the way humans see it, with the buttons and the language, or it should be with the HTML, JavaScript, and, this, and the CSS. Yeah. What's What do you think is the better? Uh, so today, all of this interaction is mostly on the level of HTML, CSS, and so on. That's done uh, because of computational constraints. Uh, but I think ultimately, um, uh, everything is designed for human visual consumption. And so at the end of the day, there's all the additional information is in 
uh, the layout of the web page yeah. and what's next to you and what's a red background and all this kind of stuff and what it looks like visually. So I think that's the final frontier as we are taking in uh, pixels and we're giving out keyboard mouse commands. Uh, but I think it's impractical still today 